When you're raising a bell, you need a firm, comfortable and stable stance, just like you do when you're ringing normally. Try and get the feet slightly apart, one in front of the other. That's a nice stable base. Avoid, if you can, having your feet wide apart or jammed firmly together. That will encourage more upper body movement, which is unnecessary, inefficient and distracting to others. Your feet should remain firmly on the floor. You should not need to go on tiptoe and indeed they shouldn't leave the floor at all. Uh, ballet and other dance is not part of bell ringing. Try and keep your knees flexible and not stiff. This allows you to drop some body weight onto the rope and get it swinging initially. Once the bell is moving, you will raise it by transferring energy from your arms and hands through the rope to the bell. And you'll do this by drawing your hands and arms down firmly over the longest possible distance, keeping tension in the rope all the time. The greater the distance, the more energy you will transfer to the bell and the faster it will go up. So when you start to ring a bell up, the bell moves through a very small arc and starts to chime as the clapper hits the bell on one side. Gradually the arc increases and you'll see that the clapper begins to hit both sides of the bell. It's now doubling and that happens about a third of the way up. Gradually after that the bell swings through a wider and wider arc until it's up. up you'll see that the clapper connects with the bell at each stroke just before the top of the swing. Okay. Before you take coils it's essential that you check that the bell is down. If you take coils and then pull the bell and find that it's up it's possible that you're not going to be able to release them quickly enough and some sort of injury might result. So the golden rule here is always check that the bell is down before you take coils. To do this you take the tail end in your left hand in the normal way and with your right hand using just two fingers and a thumb you try and move the sally and make the bell swing. If it swings it's down and safe. If it doesn't the bell is probably up and you need to double check. As a first step and using the principles of whole part whole skill development, the first step for your new ringer is to get the bell halfway up from down without the use of coils. This will often be done as part of their first lesson, perhaps even their first task in bell ringing. Here the teacher holds the tail end but ensuring that they don't interfere with the learner in any way and the learner raises the bell to about halfway. The teacher needs to make sure that the new ringer is learning how to keep tension in the rope not just as it comes down but also as it rises slowing the hands down as they rise and accelerating them to draw the rope down. What you're teaching here is tension, making sure that there's a good connection between the hands and the bell for as long as possible. For this learner there is no tension. The hands are rising up before they are drawn up by the rope and the weight of the bell. So the rope is slack. As a result there is little control and the sally is thrown forwards and maybe even all around the ringing chamber. It might be necessary to correct this by using physical, verbal or other prompts, 
possibly even some physical assistance by putting your hands on the learner's hands to ensure that they feel the bell as it rises and they draw the rope straight down with tension as the rope descends. With this next exercise, our new ringer will ring the bell all the way up without coils and without using the sally under the guidance of their teacher. By doing this, they will get the experience of what it's like to ensure that there is tension in the rope even when the bell is fully up without the added complication of having to manage coils or the sally. Our teacher will have to observe a number of important points whilst our learner does this and give our new ringer feedback on each of them. Where the learner is successful and is getting the movements correct and keeping tension in the rope, the teacher will praise to encourage the new ringer. Where things are not correct, our teacher will give feedback and guidance and opportunity to practice and get things right. As the bell goes up and you slide your hands down the rope, a coil will get tight around your fingers and it's necessary to release the coil. If in doing that you release too much rope, then you have to take it up again by creeping or shuffling up the rope until your hands are together and you have full control again over the bell. The biggest issue and danger lies with release of the last coil when the bell is nearly up. It's very important that you do not allow the bell to go over the balance or set it unless you're ringing it correctly with both hands on the sally and without coils. If there's no stay on the bell or you bump it and break it then you don't want the bell to go over the balance when you have coils in your hand. So the challenge is to find a simple way of releasing the last coil which allows your hands to stay in the same position. That way you're not going to suddenly release unnecessary rope. At the very bottom of the backstroke, you can release the tail end by opening your left thumb and it will fall forward and out of your hands. Your hands then are in the same position, no extra rope has been released and the exercise has been carried out simply and efficiently. If your hands don't go down far enough, you may have some difficulty in releasing the tail end. Some people call it a flick and give their left hand a little flick to push the tail end forward. But generally speaking, the dynamic movement of the bell and your hands and arms is enough to allow the tail end to be released. This can be practiced without the bell moving by the teacher and learner working together. The teacher needs to be high up and to make sure that the learner draws the rope straight down. Don't be tempted to demonstrate it or to practice it by pushing the learner's hands forward in a horizontal position because that's what will happen when they do it in real life. Before you start to raise the bell you have to make some coils. Make sure that the tail end of the rope is not very long, just a couple of inches or so, and it's tucked neatly into the crook between your thumb and index finger. And then make two or maybe three other coils around your hand. Not too tight. And then make two or three other coils around your hand, making sure that they're not too tight or too slack so that they're going to fly around and cause inconvenience. Here you can see ringer and trainer working together to raise the bell using coils. The teacher has not introduced the hand stroke at this stage. Possibly the learner has not rung a hand stroke yet and certainly not both strokes together. That comes much later. But you can teach someone to raise even in the early stages with coils but without the added complexity of the hand stroke. Watch as the ringer releases their coils and their hands gradually slide down the rope as the bell is raised with good tension and neat placement of the sally.
And finally, of course, the new ringers are able to do the complete process on their own. Beginning to touch the sally as it starts bobbing. Eventually, of course, they're able to ring the sally with one hand. And once they've released the last coil, use two hands on the sally and set to the bell. Of course, not everything always goes according to plan, and sometimes you can get a bell up wrong. That means that the clapper is on the wrong side of the bell when it's up. It's on the high side of the bell's lip and not the low side. This can make a difference to the feel of the bell and the sound of the bell. When the clapper strikes the bell to produce sound, clapper and bell are moving in the same direction. When the bell is up wrong, they're moving in opposite directions and generally a harder hit is made by the clapper. So sometimes the bell can sound a little louder. So how do you know whether the bell is upright or wrong? Well, you could go and have a look at it, but one of the simplest ways, which works with most bells except particularly big ones, is to bounce the bell on the stay very gently and you will hear it rattle. That means that the clapper is bouncing against the lip of the bell and making a noise. And it does that because the centre of gravity has changed and the clapper is no longer resting firmly on the low side of the bell, but is on the high side of the lip, much nearer the centre of gravity, and that's encouraging it to move when you bounce it against the stay. So how do you get a bell upright? Well, you need to make sure that it's chiming at the beginning and also you need to ensure that it continues to sound as you raise the bell. Often if a bell misses sounding twice consecutively the clapper will have gone over onto the wrong side. So if it misses once make sure you check the rope on the next stroke pushing the clapper against the lip of the bell and making it strike. That will help it get up the right way. Generally speaking, it's easier to make sure that a bell goes up right if you go up fairly quickly. Keeping a bell chiming for any length of time or going up slowly is very, very hard, particularly on heavier bells where you need to get a bell up quickly so that you're not straining yourself with the chiming. Once the clapper is striking on both sides of the bell, it's not going to go wrong at that stage and you needn't worry about checking the bell any further. Once a bell is up wrong, the best way of correcting it is to lower the bell and pull it up again. Now let's look at the whole process from beginning to end. Our teacher continues to watch the learner's progress and style and will give feedback and assistance and the opportunity to practice where he sees things are not quite right.